92nd Street Y Online Media is made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. This program, part of the Unterberg Poetry Center's 75 at 75 project, features Elizabeth Bishop reading from her work. It was recorded on October 10, 1977, before a live audience at New York's 92nd <coughs> Street Y. I'm sorry I have a slight cold, so I may be hoarse from time to time. Thank you very much, May. <laughs> I hadn't planned to read the poem that she spoke about called The Waiting Room, but I think perhaps I'll have to after that. <laughs> I was going to begin with a few very old poems and rather short ones, and then uh, read one or two later ones and one so far unpublished poem. The first one is one of the first poems I ever published. It's, I hate to think how many years old it is, but <clears throat> it's called The Map. Land lies in water. It is shadowed green. Shadows, or are they shallows? At its edges, showing the line of long, seaweeded ledges where weeds hang to the simple blue from green. Or does the land lean down to lift the sea from under, drawing it unperturbed around itself? Along the fine, tan, sandy shelf is the land tugging at the sea from under. The shadow of Newfoundland lies flat and still. Labrador is yellow, where the moony Eskimo has oiled it. We can stroke these lovely bays under a glass as if they were expected to blossom, or as if to provide a clean cage for invisible fish. The names of seashore towns run out to sea. The names of cities cross the neighboring mountains. The printer here experiencing the same excitement as when emotion too far had seeds its cause. These peninsulas take the water between thumb and finger like women feeling for the smoothness of yard goods. Mapped waters are more quiet than the land is, lending the land their waves' own confirmation. And Norway's hair runs south in agitation. Profiles investigate the sea where land is. Are they assigned? Or can the countries pick their colors? What suits the character or the native waters best? Topography displays no favorites. North is near as west. More delicate than the historians are the map makers' colors. Here's another very old poem, uh, and based on a sort of parody of a Felisa Hemans, I think, poem called Casabianca. Loves the boy stood on the burning deck, trying to recite. The boy stood on the burning deck. Loves the sun stood stammering elocution, while the poor ship in flames went down. Loves the obstinate boy, the ship, even the swimming sailors who would like a schoolroom platform too or an excuse to stay on deck, and loves the burning boy. <clears throat> this is a poem. Uh, of, I lived in Florida in Key West and for many years, when there were a great many Cubans, about more than a third of the population was Cuban. And uh, this is a description of a house, a man I actually knew, called Geronimo, called Geronimo's house. My house, my fairy palace, is a perishable clabbards with three rooms in all. My gray wasp's nest of chewed up paper glued with spit. My home, my love nest, is endowed with a veranda of wooden lace 
adorned with ferns planted in sponges, and the front room with red and green leftover Christmas decorations looped from the corners to the middle above my little center table of woven wicker painted blue and four blue chairs and an affair for the smallest baby with a tray with 10 big beads. Then on the walls, two palm leaf fans and a calendar and on the table, one fried fish spattered with burning scarlet sauce, a little dish of hominy grits and four pink tissue paper roses. Also, I have hung on a hook an old French horn repainted with aluminum paint. I play each year in the parade for Jose Marti. At night, you'd think my house abandoned. Come closer. You can see and hear the writing paper lines of light and the voices of my radio singing flamencos in between the lottery numbers. When I move, I take these things, not much more, from my shelter from the hurricane. This is another <clears throat> poem about Florida. Drink the water. Uh, it's called The Bite, a B I G H T, written on my birthday. Low tide like this, how sheer the water is. White crumbling ribs of marl protrude and glare, and the boats are dry, the pilings dry as matches. Absorbing rather than being absorbed, the water in the bite doesn't wet anything. The color of the gas flame turned as low as possible. One can smell it turning to gas. If one were Baudelaire, one could probably hear it turning to marimba music. The little ochre dredge at work off the end of the dock already plays the dry, perfectly offbeat claves. The birds are outsized. Pelicans crash into this peculiar gas, unnecessarily hard, it seems to me, like pickaxes, rarely coming up with anything to show for it and going off with humorous elbowings. Black and white man-of-war birds soar on impalpable drafts and open their tails like scissors on the curves or tense them like wishbones till they tremble. The frowsy sponge boats keep coming in with the obliging air of retrievers bristling with jack straw gaffs and hooks decorated with baubles of sponges. There's a fence of chicken wire along the dock where, glinting like little plowshares, the blue-gray shark tails are hung up to dry for the Chinese restaurant trade. Some of the little white boats are still piled up against each other or lie on their sides, stove in and not yet salvaged, if they ever will be, from the last bad storm, like torn open, unanswered letters. The bite is littered with old correspondences. Click, click goes the dredge, brings up a dripping jaw full of marl. All the untidy activity continues, awful but cheerful. I think since Miss Swenson mentioned that poem called In the Waiting Room, I'll have to read it if you can put up with my hoarseness. I 
it's rather long, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Called In the Waiting Room. In Worcester, Massachusetts, I went with Aunt Consuelo to keep her dentist appointment and sat and waited for her in the dentist's waiting room. It was winter, got dark early. The waiting room was full of grown-up people, arctics and overcoats, lamps and magazines. My aunt was inside what seemed like a long time, and while I waited, I read the National Geographic. I could read and carefully studied the photographs. The inside of a volcano, black and full of ashes. Then it was spilling over in rivulets of fire. Osa and Martin Johnson dressed in riding breeches, laced boots and pith helmets. A dead man slung on a pole, long pig, the caption said. Babies with pointed heads wound round and round with string. Black naked women with necks wound round and round with wire like the necks of light bulbs. Their breasts were horrifying. I read it right straight through. I was too shy to stop. And then I looked at the cover, the yellow margins, the date. Suddenly from inside came an O oh of pain, Aunt Consuelo's voice not very loud or long. I wasn't at all surprised. Even then, I knew she was a foolish, timid woman. I might have been embarrassed, but wasn't. What took me completely by surprise was that it was me, my voice in my mouth. Without thinking at all, I was my foolish aunt. I, we, were falling, falling. Our eyes glued to the cover of the National Geographic, February 1918. I said to myself, three days and you'll be seven years old. I was saying it to stop the sensation of falling off the round, turning world into cold, blue-black space. But I felt, you're an I, you're an Elizabeth, you're one of them. Why should you be one, too? I scarcely dared to look to see what it was I was. I gave a side long glance. I couldn't look any higher. Shadowy gray knees, trousers and skirts and boots and different pairs of hands lying under the lamps. I knew that nothing stranger had ever happened. Nothing stranger could ever happen. Why should I be my aunt, or me, or anyone? What similarities? Boots, hands, the family voice I felt in my throat, or even the National Geographic, and those awful hanging breasts held us all together or made us all just one. How I didn't know any word for it, how unlikely. How had I come to be here like them? And over here, a cry of pain it could have got loud and worse, but hadn't. The waiting room was bright and too hot. It was sliding beneath a big black wave, another and another. Then I was back in it. The war was on. Outside in Worcester, Massachusetts, were night and slush and cold and it was still the 5th of February, 1918. I think I'll read one more, a fairly long one. This has not been published yet, and it's about uh, a place in Brazil. I lived in Brazil many years, but this is a a town about halfway down the Amazon, from where it begins to be the Amazon to the mouth of the river, called Santa Rame. It's the biggest, it's a small place, but it's the biggest town there is. And I was very much taken with this. The ship I was on stopped for a day there, and we went ashore and explored it. 
And I had never written much about it except in a diary, and then I decided to write a poem about it. Uh, there are two or three Portuguese words in it. Uh, perhaps I should explain. Maybe you all know what a zebu is. Uh, I don't know whether it's common. It's a kind of ox that was imported from India for the tropics. And they have great drooping horns, and their ears hang down. They're still used a great deal. They're, when they're matched pairs, they're very handsome. And I refer to azulejos, which is the word for tiles, although it sounds like the word blue, and I suppose it came from Delft originally, the blue and white, but it's the common word for tiles. I think that's the only thing that's mysterious about this. The name of the place is Santa Ray. <clears throat> of course, I may be remembering it all wrong after, after how many years? That golden evening, I really wanted to go no farther. More than anything else, I wanted to stay a while in that conflux of two great rivers, Tapajos and Amazon, grandly, silently flowing, flowing east. Suddenly there had been houses, people, and lots of mongrel river boats skittering back and forth under a sky of gorgeous, underlit clouds with everything gilded, burnished along one side, and everything bright, cheerful, casual, or so it looked. I liked the place. I liked the idea of the place. Two rivers. Hadn't two rivers sprung from the Garden of Eden? No, that was four, and they diverged. Here only two, and coming together. Even if one were tempted to literary interpretation, such as life, death, right, wrong, male, female. Such notions would have resolved, dissolved straight off in that watery, dazzling dialectic. In front of the church, the cathedral rather, there is a modest promenade and a belvedere about to fall in the river. Stubby palms, flamboyants like pans of embers, Buildings one story high, stucco, blue or yellow. One house faced with azulejos, buttercup yellow. The street was deep in dark gold river sand, damp from the ritual afternoon rain. And teams of zebus plodded, gentle, proud, and blue, with down curved horns and hanging ears, pulling carts with solid wheels. The zebu's hoofs, the people's feet, weighted in golden sand, dampered by golden sand. So that the on, almost the only sounds were creaks and shush, shush, shush. Two rivers full of crazy shipping, people all apparently changing their minds, embarking, disembarking, rowing clumsy dories. After the Civil War, some southern families came here. Here they could still own slaves. They left occasional blue eyes, English names, and oars. No other place, no one, on all the Amazon's 4,000 miles does anything but paddle. A dozen or so young nuns, white habited, waved gaily from an old stern wheeler getting up steam, already hung with hammocks. Off to their mission, days and days away up God knows what lost tributary. Side wheelers, countless wobbling dugouts. A cow stood up in one, quite calm, chewing her cud while being ferried, tipping, wobbling, somewhere to be married. A river schooner with raked masts and violet-colored sails tacked in so close her bowsprit seemed to touch the church, the cathedral, rather. A week or so before there had been a thunderstorm, and the cathedral had been struck by lightning. One tower had a widening zigzag crack all the way down. It was a miracle. The priest's house right next door had been struck too, and his brass bed, the only one in town, galvanized black. 
Gracias a Dios, he had been in Belém. <laughs> in the blue pharmacy, the pharmacist had hung an empty wasp's nest from a shelf, a small, exquisite, clean matte white and hard as stucco. I admired it so much he gave it to me. Then my ship's whistle blew, I couldn't stay. Back on board, a fellow passenger, Mr. Swan, Dutch, the retiring head of Phillips Electric, really a very nice old man, who wanted to see the Amazon before he died, asked, what's that ugly thing? I think that's enough. Thanks for listening. 92nd Street Y, Unterberg Poetry Center webcasts, and access to our archive are made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. For more information on 92nd Street Y and all our programs, please visit us on the web at 92y.org. This program is copyright 1977 by 92nd Street Y.